We're very lucky today to have three great speakers speaking to us today about autism spectrum disorder. We know it's an increasingly common, commonly identified issue we were just talking about. I want to introduce our speakers today. Um, Dr. Zal Scheftel is a child and adolescent psychiatrist in the Division of Mental Health and Child Development at UCSF Many Children's Hospital, Oakland, and in the Division of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry in the UCSF Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. She provides clinical care at the outpatient clinics at Benioff Children's Hospital, Oakland, and at Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital and Trauma Center. Dr. Emma Salzman is a licensed clinical psychologist in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at UCSF. She specializes in comprehensive diagnostic evaluations for a range of developmental, neurodevelopmental disorders, including autism spectrum disorders. And we have Dr. NG Len, who is a clinical psychologist and associate clinical professor at the UCF Center for ASD and NDDs. Her clinical and research interests are in the assessment and treatment of people with autism spectrum disorder and other neurodevelopmental disorders. So we're really lucky to have all three here. Um, we're about to get started, but just like a couple of quick notes. Um, as questions come up, please do feel free to enter them into the Q&A section. Um, all of us will be able, uh, as speakers and panelists will be able to see them and um, may be able to answer them and through the chat, but we'll try to reserve the last like five minutes or so to take some of them live. And um, please do keep yourself muted. All right, with that, I'll go ahead and pass off the mic to Dr. Shuffle. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, I'm really happy to be here with Dr. Lynn and Dr. Salzman to talk more about um, autism spectrum disorders. Uh, so we don't have anything to disclose um, for this presentation. Um, so today we'll uh, describe um, more about the diagnosis, screening, and early detection of children with autism spectrum disorder. Um, we'll describe what's involved in an autism assessment and review the general treatment considerations for people with autism. And last, we'll discuss the pharmacologic management for psychiatric comorbidities in children and adolescents with autism. So autism spectrum disorder or ASD is a neurodevelopmental disorder with symptoms that fall in two main domains. Uh, the first domain involves deficits in social communication and social interaction. So difficulty with social emotional reciprocity or back and forth communication, nonverbal communication, such as eye contact or body language, um, developing and maintaining relationships. The second domain is the restrictive and repetitive behaviors, often referred to for short as RRBs. Um, this category includes the stereotyped or repetitive movements or what we often call stimming behaviors like hand flapping, rocking, pacing. Um, also repetitive use of objects or speech um, like lining up toys or repeating certain phrases. Uh, there's an, um, often an inflexible insistence on maintaining routines um, and the changing of routines or transitions can result in a lot of distress. Also, lastly, the um, sensitivities, there's a lot of sensitivities to sensory input, also restricted interests um, and sensitivities to sensory in input like um, sounds, textures, things like that. And those often do lead to distress as well, um, feeling overwhelmed. Sometimes they're seeking out um, of more like extra sensory seeking behavior too. So it's important to note that like the name implies, um, autism occurs on a spectrum. It's um, a really heterogeneous population and beyond the core symptoms of autism, there are certain specifiers that can assist us in further describing patients with autism. The diagram here shows different areas which warrant their own evaluation and reflect the specifiers in the DSM. They're really relevant because they impact treatment planning for um, kids with autism. And so autism can be present with or without intellectual and language impairment. Um, individuals can be minimally verbal or high, um, high functioning with really strong intellectual and language um, capacity. Uh, autism can also be associated with medical problems or genetic syndromes. A common one, a common genetic syndrome associated with autism is fragile X and there are a number of others uh, and they each have unique presentations. 
And the association between autism and uh, psychiatric and behavioral issues is well appreciated. It's what I'll specifically talk about later in this talk. Um, and I'm gonna turn it over now to Dr. Lynn and Dr. Salzman who will discuss the screening assessment and treatment of uh, ASD. Thank you. Um, so yeah, let's move on to the next slide, please. Um, so, um, so universal screening for autism has really been widely accepted in primary care um, at well child checks, which I'm sure you guys all know um, very well. And so in order to really kind of better understand the presence of delays or differences or abnormal behaviors, it's really critical to understand normative development. And there have been lots of efforts um, to make milestone trackers available to parents and really disseminate this kind of information um, to providers as well um, to really help guide an understanding of what sort of typical development is like. Um, and it's really, it's so important to help engage um, families in this kind of developmental um, monitoring. monitoring. Um, and um, the CDC actually just updated their milestones um, and they have a whole bunch of materials that are really wonderful. If you haven't um, checked them out already, I would really encourage you to do that. And so the milestones kind of now include, um, or the milestones kind of are including um, uh, skills that 75% or more children would be expected to achieve, to achieve them at the age that they're listed. And so um, listed below here are some, um, some really good resources that I really recommend looking through um, later. And they have really kind of wonderful age-based guidelines um, for social, emotional and language and physical development and co cognitive milestones um, and their principal handouts. Um, uh, so you can also hand them out to parents too. Um, all right, next slide. So, um, the AAP recommends that developmental and behavioral um, screening um, uh, occur for children during well child visits at nine months, 18 months, and 30 months. But in addition to that, they also recommend um, autism specific screening at well child visits um, at 18 months and 24 months. Um, and some might suggest even earlier screening for autism. Um, we know that diagnoses of autism um, become more stable as a child gets older, but autism symptoms can emerge um, pretty early um, on for some um, within even the first year of life. Um, but there's still a lot of um, significant kind of heterogeneity within um, symptom presentation. Um, so for, for many children, there are differences in social communication skills, um, kind of early in development, um, but both retrospective and prospective studies have really highlighted the fact that the onset of symptoms is really widely variable. And what's important here is that we recognize that most children attain some of these really early social communication milestones by 18 months. Um, and so this is a graph um, on the right here from a Norwegian mother, um, father, and child cohort study. It's called MOBA. Um, it's a prospective study. And it really just drives home the point that if you don't um, sort of, or if you're not sort of consistently seeing these, um, these skills by 18 months, um, there's really a true developmental difference. Um, next slide, please. Um, for, um, for many kind of developmental differences emerge, as I was saying, kind of very early in life. And, um, autism is, um, a very heterogeneous disorder, um, and the way in which and, and when symptoms emerge can also reflect that heterogeneity. Um, so very young children with autism, especially some of the sort of brighter children can demonstrate similar social behaviors as their neurotypical peers, but use these behaviors less often or more inconsistently um, for social interactions. And so these are things like use of eye contact, smiling at and with parents, um, limited sort of facial expressions, um, difficulties responding to name, directed vocalizations or babbling, 
um, these are all likely um, some of the earliest markers of autism um, and sometimes start to differentiate autism from other disorders at a rate around age 12 months. Um, but what's important here is that it's not the um, complete absence of these behaviors, but the frequency with which they are used to communicate with others. And so other, ch other children really kind of um, show a delay in development. Um, and some children can hit some of um, these early social markers, the social skills markers, um, and then kind of level off or plateau in their development. Um, and others also might show a loss in skills. Um, and even other groups of children might not be identified until later in life um, when there are more sophisticated and complex social communication skills that are really needed to succeed in various settings, um, like at school. Um, and so even though autism symptoms can manifest in the first years of life and can be diagnosed pretty reliably by 18 months, the average age of diagnosis continues to be four years old and older um, in some children um, or in some groups of children like um, children of color or disproportionately underrepresented groups um, or disadvantaged groups. So this is ideally where um, screening comes into play. Um, and so screening plays a really important role for individual families. Um, it's often the first step in obtaining an assessment and tailored treatment planning, um, which is really the goal of assessment. Um, and um, an early intervention is important because it's thought to have a great impact on the individual family and society as a whole. Um, and children who are screened positive um, tend to be diagnosed um, earlier in life, um, about seven months earlier on average. Um, and so we have a variety of screening tools. So we have, um, we're not gonna go through all of them today. Um, we have level one screeners, um, which are really brief and they're designed to have really high sensitivity, ideally have high sensitivity and used um, in the general population. Um, and then level two screeners, um, are designed to um, really differentiate autism from other neurodevelopmental disorders. All right, next slide. So um, the MCHAT is um, sort of by and large the most well-researched screener for autism. Um, and it's also one of the most um, widely disseminated screeners. Um, and it's designed for um, children um, 16 to 30 months. It's a 24, um, item parent report questionnaire um, with follow-up questions, with a follow-up interview, which is really designed to reduce false positives. And this follow-up interview um, and follow-up questions are really one of the most important aspects of the MCHAT. Um, and the, on the questionnaire, um, parents either answer yes or no to a variety of different questions. Um, and a recent meta-analysis shows that um, sort of the sensitivity and specificity are pretty, um, pretty okay. But um, um, uh, let's go to the next slide, please. Um, but there's more recent um, research kind of looking at how the MCHAT performs in the general population, um, which has suggested that the sensitivity um, is influenced by many factors like age, developmental delays, pediatrician follow-up, and parental concerns. Um, and so this is also true for other screeners um, as well. And so the psychometrics of the MCHAT really vary depending on some of these factors. Um, and in some studies, um, many children who screen positive at 18 months go on and obtain a diagnosis of autism, but also a good amount of them um, uh, who screen positive go on and receive only an intellectual disability diagnosis, so um, not autism later on in life. And so when the MCHAT is used in the general population, the positive predictive value has been found to be kind of low, so between 6% and 15%. Um, there's a slight increase in the positive predictive value when the MCHAT is used in high-risk populations um, or when there's already been a developmental difference um, identified. Um, and um, also in the sort of 
general population studies, um, the sensitivity of the MCHAT was lower in um, younger children than in older children. So the MCHAT might be missing more children with autism than it's detecting. And so um, the screener might really not be sensitive enough to capture the more nuanced differences that are specific to autism. Um, and this could be partly due to the fact that parents have to kind of um, categorize either the presence or the absence of a behavior rather than the ability to kind of rate the behavior dimensionally. And that's partly why the follow-up questions are so important as well. Um, okay, next slide. Um, and so one inherent challenge of all screeners are the well-known um, health disparities. Um, children who are not screened were more likely to be from non-English speaking families or be part of a racial minority group um, or um, have lower education or lower income. Um, and some, um, some people have suggested that some possible solutions for this. And so um, having an increase in support staff or clinic flow or considering um, kind of where the screening is completed, like is it completed at home before um, the visit or in the waiting room or with the help of clinic staff um, and um, considering kind of who, who completes the screen, like, um, maybe possibly including child care providers um, to just help ensure that all babies get screened. Um, and the MCHAT is also um, less accurate in girls than boys. And so the specific um, sensitivity and specificity, oh, you can go back a slide, well, that's fine. Um, uh, sort of in the positive predictive value and the negative predictive values, um, of all screeners have been um, difficult to study for a, sort of a variety of different reasons, um, including ascertainment challenges and um, study designs and follow-up for individuals who screen negative who might um, later get a diagnosis of autism. And so level one screeners should be chosen really carefully um, and um, an understanding of the psychometric properties of the screener you use is really important. Um, we know that developmental level, age, and um, parent concerns often impact performance on these screeners. And so pediatricians selecting them and also interpreting them um, should really understand the, the strengths and um, limitations of them. Um, and so, um, so all of these sort of factors, you can go on to the next slide, really um, highlight the importance of your role as pediatricians to help guide parents in determining um, atypical development. And so, um, so what do you say, you know, if you have concerns, like what's next? Um, like, what do you do after a positive screen? And so often after you make a referral, if you do decide to make a referral, um, it's up to parents to really follow through on the referral for a comprehensive evaluation, which just really underscores the importance of um, a clear, empathic, and um, really kind of convincing communication with parents. Um, for the sake of time, I'm not gonna read through these, but these are just some quotes or some examples of what you could potentially say to parents if you have concerns um, about um, their child and um, their social communication skills. Um, and uh, we can go on to the next slide. Um, and then, you know, if there is a question about what does the evaluation look like, like what does it entail? Um, you could say something like this, um, but typically an evaluation really entails an interview with parents um, and direct play-based um, activities with the child um, and, um, and observations of, of the child's social communication skills and other behaviors. Um, and sometimes it also looks like talking to teachers or collecting information from other people who know the child well. Um, and one important thing to note here too is a school evaluation um, is typically conducted to determine eligibility for educational services, um, but it does not equate to a diagnostic evaluation. So 
even if a child comes into clinic with an educational classification of autism, this does not mean that they have a medical diagnosis. And so a medical diagnosis is often required to access care outside of school. And I'm going to go ahead and pass, pass it on to NG. All right, great. Next slide. Great. So as you've heard from Emma, screeners are a really big part of being able to um, get folks who are on the spectrum um, over to the side of it being able to access interventions. Um, but, um, you know, as we've alluded, um, there's so much more to this. And you as a pediatrician play such a big role, especially your clinical judgment. And we do understand there are lots of barriers. The visits with, uh, with uh, patients are brief. Um, there's also this lag time in between these little child visits, several months that go by. Um, and other things to consider are things like clinical resources and other conditions that you guys have to manage, not just ASD that you're kind of looking for and trying to rule out, but there are a whole slew of other medical and neurodevelopmental and genetic conditions. Um, the, you know, parent concern is um, equally important, um, more, again, more than beyond just screeners. Um, for parents, pediatricians are a first point of contact to have concerns. Um, so the screeners are important, but also for the pediatrician to elicit parent concerns. And we'll talk a little bit more about why that's important. But that means op asking these open-ended questions to understand um, what are concerns that parents are having about their child's development. Other key players for family members as well as pediatricians are these other kind of sources of information, other caregivers and family members, such as family, friends, or grandparents, and then even the early child care providers and schools, um, teachers um, will often, sometimes if parents don't have a concern, they will um, let the parents know, um, and that elicits a parent to hopefully let the pediatrician know that there were some concerns. But other professional providers like early intervention program providers, um, they are also a great resource. Um, the trouble is just having the pediatrician get access to these other uh, providers and family members so that they can be able to get that information from them. But these or the other sources are really important because they you know, these other caregivers and members of this child's life is able to see them more frequently. So the time frame is really important. They see them, um, you know, kind of on a wider scale than, than, a, than a clinic visit too. So um, their um, input is really valuable. Next slide. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about parent concern. So um, the research robustly shows that parent concerns really uh, strongly predict screen positives on screeners. So in one study, 93% of MCHAT screen positives, those parents had concerned and those um, uh, th uh, received a diagnosis of ASD or developmental delay. The more concerns a parent has across areas of development, then more items are endorsed on screeners. Um, parent concerns predicts diagnosis as well as severity of ASC. So the earlier a parent has concern, usually that's links, linked to more severe um, presentations of ASD. And of course, the opposite lack of parent concern when there actually is a reason to have concern results in delays in diagnosis as well. Next slide. Um, here are some additional details. So as Emma was saying, parent concern usually arises in the first, uh, in the child's first two years of life. There is about like a third of parents who actually have concerns before the child's first birthday. Um, and so parent concerns at 12 months old often predicts ASD diagnosis because the differences are present earlier on. Um, and symptoms um, develop gradually over time during the first two years of life. Um, and so it's really key to be able to keep checking in with parents and having these repeat um, kind of screeners and check-ins done because um, they might not be present um, right away. Maybe at 12 months, parents are kind of getting an inkling and then at 18 months um, and, and on, um, these concerns become uh, more robust. Usually first or early concerns are related to language delay or some kind of social communication concern like, oh, you know, they're not seeming to like point at things and enjoy things with me. 
Um, there is some research to say maybe broadband screeners would be helpful because you have a wider net um, to capture some of these differences because uh, the research is showing that um, early concerns for ISD seem more broad um, and then they become a little bit more, uh, more and more closely connected to your, your kind of um, ASD presentation over time. Later concerns for children with ASD include behavioral and motor differences. Um, and so by about 12 months, the concerns become more specific to ASD with that whole kind of, you know, constellation of social communication impairments and restricted or repetitive behaviors. And that's when these ASD specific screeners seem to be really, um, you know, uh, more sensitive. Next slide. So what about parents? What do they know about these concerns and what do they think it's pointing to? only 5% of parents labeled autism as a specific concern. So it sounds like they are endorsing concerns about their child's development, but they don't really know what this constellation of symptoms means. Um, so they are picking out up, up on these very, develop, um, er, very important developmental differences. If in a study that compared children with ASD with ID or uh, developmental delay. Usually the children um, of, uh, are younger when their per parents first report concerns. So at, at about two years of age, uh, parents have reported concerns to their pediatrician. 22% um, of, of, of kids pass their first screening who are later diagnosed, but they later fail. So this is important to have these repeat screenings. And often if a parent has a concern, um, they generally have these uh, concerns um, uh, throughout the rest of the well child visits. All right, next slide. All right, so now here we are, right? There's, we know all this research about early signs of autism, the trajectory of symptoms, and even that there is really great intervention out there for kids on the spectrum. But there's really a big disconnect that continues to be present between knowledge and what really happens in real life. As Emma said, their diagnoses are often not made until four years or later. Um, and it seems that um, there's a multi there are multiple things going on, but one of the things that the research is showing is that early concerns are not acted upon by pediatricians. So usually, um, and it makes sense, pediatricians uh, may not refer when children are younger age because they think, wow, they are still so young, let's wait and see. But this actually goes against the evidence out there that in children with ASD, there is an early onset of symptoms that is earlier than just developmental delays alone. Even with screen positives, um, pediatricians, like I mentioned, might say, hey, you know, this is too early, let's wait and see. Or sometimes pediatricians don't see those concerns. And so even though a, a parent or child might have enough concerns to meet cutoff levels, they might not refer the family because of these two things. Um, in one study of a uh, community sample of pediatricians in the San Diego County area, there were uh, only 40% of positive screens were actually referred um, on to evaluations by pediatricians. All right, next slide. So um, what, should, what is the research on pediatrician response? Proactive pediatrician responses led to quicker ASD diagnosis, whereas passive reassuring pediatrician responses led to delays in the ASD diagnosis. The suggestion was if there is a strong belief that the pediatrician would like to wait, it needs to be active waiting. So there is a deadline and there's more frequent monitoring versus just let's wait and see because then you've often missed out on very important milestones and access to treatment. There's actually about a three year delay between when parents first mention um, that they have concerns to their pediatrician and then the diagnosis of ASD. That's three years that the child did not get um, autism specific interventions. Um, and this is really heartbreaking because earlier diagnosis we know leads to earlier treatment. Um, and in one study, when pediatricians referred early, children were able to start intervention as early as 21 months of age, which is several years before the national average. Um, there's even research to show that earlier intervention by two years can make a bigger impact in social communication gains than if, if a child were an older toddler. And so the brain is just rapidly growing and we want kids to access these evidence-based treatments. Next slide. <clears throat> 
So we, next, we want to help you guys with your clinical judgment, help you understand some milder presentations of autism, some differentials from other neurodevelopmental and psychiatric conditions, and then thinking about how some of these um, presentations of ASD, they might look like uh, neurotypical development, but they're different, and thinking about some sex differences as well. Next slide. So uh, one of the things we've learned is that often um, with um, ASD, um, there are a lot of children who are early identified because they have language delay, but language is very complex. There is about a small portion, 30% of children who are minimally verbal, they don't acquire language in the same way um, despite interventions. Um, but it's really important to think about delays and differences in, in language beyond just single words. We also have to think about complex language. So you want to think about how they're using their language. There may be kids who are very verbal, who have complex language, but what they're having trouble with is actually their pragmatics. So asking questions to learn about others, making comments, engaging in conversation. So it's not just language delay, but looking out for how they're using their language. Next slide. Then we want to think about intellectual disability and autism. So there's a lot more variability than what we initially thought. The, in the past, ASD was highly associated with intellectual disability, but now in, popu in population-based samples, we're finding that those who have average IQ or higher make about 50% about in population samples and 30% in clinical samples. So even though somebody has um, ID, we, we should still think, hey, you know, they might, they might be um, presenting with ASD as well as um, ID as well. So that's something to keep in mind. Next slide. Then um, Emma talked about this too, that um, we're finding for kids is not necessarily an absence of certain kinds of social communication um, skills, um, but with something like social interest, what you see in milder cases is actually a range from disinterest to interest. Those with interest who have ASD, we are seeing inconsistency with skills. For example, they initiate a lot because it's self-directed, but they are not reciprocal. And that's what we often see in these milder cases or older children. Um, and the degree of social impairments vary as well. So even a child who has high verbal abilities, some of them end up having milder social impairments and repetitive behaviors, but some even with high verbal abilities actually have more severe social impairments and repetitive behaviors despite having intact cognitive and verbal abilities. Next slide. Um, and then um, in females, this is really um, you know, helpful, um, especially as the research in this area is continuing to grow. We are finding that females who are diagnosed uh, uh, later have milder um, presentations overall. They have milder restrictive repetitive behaviors. They have milder um, impairments with their social interests and communication impairments. They are more similar to typically developing boys than girls. What you see is a more socially, social exclusion versus being rejected and that they seem to seek out friendships, but they're finding it difficult to maintain. And so we want to think about females. And um, if you see these inconsistent profile in, in kids and, and, you know, you might be thinking maybe this might be autism um, uh, to refer them. Um, females often receive a diagnosis later, especially as the social um, um, skills start to advance in their peers and they're left behind. All right, next slide. And then um, we see sensory differences and repetitive behaviors across children, even in neurotypical kids and across uh, neuropsychiatric disorders. Um, what we're looking for is actually with these things is um, differences in terms of intensity, trajectory, and functional limitation. You are seeing more challenges or more of these behaviors, more than you see in neurotypical kids in terms of frequency, how intense these behaviors and how it interfering these behaviors are. And you're, you're sensing these, this is more interfering than a neurotypical kid or even another kid who might have a, a psychiatric condition. You're going to think about ASD then. All right, next slide. All right, okay, I'm going back to Emma now. Oh, yes, okay, great. <laughs> So, um, so these are just some general, um, just general information about treatments. And so um, we really want to be thinking about skills-based treatments for individuals with, um, with autism and their families um, and, um, and making sure that, that 
there's a lot of direct and explicit teaching and practice of skills. Um, we find that psychodynamic um, or psychoanalytic um, practices are, are much less um, effective than, um, than skills-based um, training programs. And, um, and coaching parents um, uh, is, is extremely helpful and really important to, um, to incorporate parents into um, behavioral treatments for autism. Um, and um, treatments need to be tailored and the type of treatment really varies depending on age and presentation um, and um, goals can, um, can vary in treatment from, um, you know, reducing anxiety to adaptive behaviors and play. Um, okay, uh, let's move to the next slide. Um, and so some typical recommendations, although there is no, um, no treatment for autism, um, often recommendations include ABA, um, and there are different kinds of ABA um, therapies. Um, we're not going to go too much into that. Um, we can go to the next slide. And um, and in line with kind of um, these skills-based um, interventions, um, we're really starting to show, oh, you can go back to the previous slide, sorry. <laughs> um, uh, uh, we're starting to show some, um, some promise in things like CBT for, um, for kids with autism or individuals with autism, but we really need to um, undergo more rigorous randomized clinical trials. Um, okay, next slide. And these are just some more resources about broad, um, broadband screeners and autism specific screeners. Um, and I think that is it. Um, Sarah, it's on to you. Thank you. So I'll try to run through um, our last section on psychiatric comorbidity and medication management, you know, relatively quickly. Um, as I mentioned earlier in talking about autism, um, the core symptom domains of social deficits and repetitive behaviors are really only part of the clinical picture. It's important to look at the child's intellectual and language abilities, um, overall level of adaptive functioning. We usually refer to patients with strong language skills and IQ, and this was talked about a little earlier, but um, as high functioning, where um, we refer to the ones with um, intellectual and language impairment needing more support as lower functioning. And in addition, uh, medical and psychiatric comorbidities are very common, and these result in additional impairment and require specific tailored treatment. I'm going to discuss specifically the common psychiatric comorbidities, um, ADHD, anxiety, depression, OCD, um, irritability, aggression. Um, I'll also briefly touch on sleep disturbances, which are very common in autism. Uh, other medical and neurologic issues are common too. There's um, GI, a lot of GI concerns like constipation that comes up, seizures are pre present in up to 25% of patients with autism, underlying genetic sy syndromes, like I mentioned earlier, um, and motor, motor issues too. You can go to the next slide. Psychiatric comorbidity is much more common in individuals with autism than in the general population. Studies have shown that 70% of patients with autism have one psychiatric comorbidity and about 40% have two. There's a large variability in the estimated prevalence rates of psychiatric comorbidities, which is related to multiple factors, including the heterogeneity of the population, and also due to the difficulty uh, diagnosing co-occurring disorders in individuals with autism. It can be hard to tell if symptoms are related to autism, for example, sensory issues and avoidant behavior being interpreted as generalized anxiety, or in many cases, autism symptoms can overshadow the other mental health symptoms, for example, irritability can be related to depression, but instead be attributed to autism. And autism with psychiatric comorbidities results in more severe autism symptoms, including more repetitive behavior, also greater impairments in psychosocial and adaptive functioning. Um, next slide. It's been reported that 50% or more of patients with um, autism take psychotropic medication, and this percentage increases with age and the presence of more comorbidities. Um, medication studies are not plentiful in this population, so many studies are small, sample sizes. Overall, there are a lot of mixed results. 
There are no medications available to treat the core symptoms of autism. And because it can be difficult to diagnose comorbid psychiatric disorders, drug studies often look at specific symptoms. A uh, common approach is to target associated symptoms like irritability, aggression, hyperactivity, and across the board, children with autism are more prone to side effects of medication. And so our motto is uh, start low and go slow. Next slide. So this study published last year highlights some of the important considerations in medication prescribing in children with autism. Lisa Wiggins and groups at multiple sites looked at psychotropic medication prescribing in preschool age children, two to five years old. They found that 60% of the children who were prescribed psychotropic medication never received behavior therapy. And about a third used medication from, one, uh, from more than one medication class. And of the children who received medication um, that were three years of age or younger, 64% of those didn't have any behavioral therapy. So this study illustrates a relatively common scenario that I think a lot of you um, pediatricians are in, um, not just in the preschool age children, but behavior therapy is really essential for the core symptoms of autism, as well as the comorbid psychiatric and behavioral problems that arise. Um, but the access to these treatments we know is just very limited, but the current, it's just really relevant to note that the current evidence does not support the use of medications without behavioral interventions. Next slide. So when do we consider medication? First, it's important to assess the current status of the therapies. Um, and the services that the child's receiving. Is the child getting ABA, speech therapy, occupational therapy at home or at school? Does the child have an IEP? Does um, he or she receive appropriate supports at school? Does the child, um, is the child a regional center client? Does the parent um, get a little respite for high, higher functioning kids with autism? Are they receiving any additional therapies that might be helpful like parent management training for ADHD or CBT for anxiety and depression or social skills training? Um, it's also important to rule out medical causes for behavior. The presence of co-occurring GI problems, seizure sleep problems um, is, is really common in ASD and it's associated with more severe behavioral symptoms. And next, looking for the psychiatric comorbidities, which we're going to talk about, um, and identifying target symptoms um, is, is that's the next step. And if the, you know, if the child does have um, services, it's helpful to enlist the support of those treatment providers when addressing the psychiatric or behavioral concern, because in addition to the caretaker, these providers are, have a really valuable perspective on what's going on. And the ABA providers often do a functional behavior assessment where they look at the triggers and the reinforcers for behavior. Um, and as was highlighted in the last slide, psychotropic medications really should not be a substitute for appropriate services like ABA, but should be considered only after maximizing behavioral interventions. Next slide. Prior to DSM-5, which was published less than 10 years ago, ADHD could not be diagnosed as a comorbid condition with autism. And now it's estimated that 40 to 70% of children with ASD have ADHD. Um, ADHD is a separate um, as a separate comorbid disorder, in addition to au autism is supported by the fact that hyperactivity, impulsivity, and distractibility add to the overall impairment seen in kids with ADHD, with, um, with autism. Children with autism appear to have more prominent hyperactivity um, in relative to inattention, which may or may not be true inattention, a, a preoccupation with a restricted interest um, can really appear like inattention in a child with autism. So it's, it's just something that we're aware of. Uh, recommended medications for ADHD in autism are the same as those in, um, in the general uh, child population include the stimulant medications and the non-stimulant med medications like the alpha agonists. Next slide. So the stimulants uh, broadly include two categories, the methylphenidates like Ritalin, Concerta, and Focalin, and the am amphetamines like Adderall and Vyvanse. Methylphenidate use for ADHD symptoms is supported by a number of different studies in uh, children with autism. The research units on pediatric psychopharmacology, or the RUP 
autism network study was the biggest and most well-known of these. And in the study consistent with others, the response rate was around 50%, which was lower than the typical 70 to 80% response expected in kids without ASD, which was shown by the MTA studies, um, which were the original studies for methylphenidate in uh, children with ADHD. And the children with autism notably experience more side effects such as decreased appetite, insomnia, irritability, emotional outbursts. In this study, the side effects resulted in withdrawal of about 20% of the patients. Um, and by comparison, if we look at the MTA study, it was only 2% that discontinued the medication. So it's, it's a significant burden of, of additional side effects that they experience. Stimulants have also been known to be more effective for the hyperactivity symptoms relative to inattentive symptoms. This may be due again to the overlapping, um, the overlapping phenomenon of the inattention with core symptoms of autism, as I described. A child that's not listening or engaging, and um, that's not listening to us, but engaging in a restricted interest, can appear inattentive. Um, so there, um, for amphetamines, there are limited studies. Uh, and overall, we know they are stronger, but come with more side effects. So we tend to use the methylphenidates more. Next slide. The non-stimulant medications include alpha agonists, guanfacine and clonidine, which originally were developed as antihypertensives and later received FDA approval for ADHD. There's two, randomized controlled uh, trials studying the effectiveness of guanfacine extended release in children with autism. The first showed that guanfacine was effective for treating hyperactivity, impulsivity, and inattention. The response rates were similar to methylphenidate in children with autism, so around 50%, but with lower frequency of side effects that led to discontinuation of the medication. And the side effects that were most common were irritability and sedation. Uh, the follow-up study uh, for guanfacine showed um, some effectiveness at reducing oppositional and repetitive behaviors, but did not show any change for anxiety or sleep. And there are very two very small um, controlled trials with less than 10 subjects studying clonidine, which showed some effectiveness for some similar symptoms. Um, and it may help with sleep latency and nighttime awakenings, but there's really limited research. And adamoxetine, um, also known as Stratera, has very relatively limited data and it's um, not our first or second line um, choice usually. Next slide. Internalizing disorders like anxiety, depression, and OCD are hard to identify in children with autism due to the difficulty they have communicating their internal state. Uh, these disorders, however, are believed to be very common, especially anxiety. It's much easier to diagnose externalizing disorders such as disruptive behavior, which can often be driven by anxiety. And anxiety and depression are more readily identified in higher functioning individuals with stronger intellectual and language abilities. Um, it's really important to diagnose anxiety and depression because they're associated with poor emotional regulation or behavior, social problems for the, for the child. And it's relevant to note that anxiety and autism is strongly correlated with the restrictive and repetitive behaviors. So it's often exacerbated by sensory sensitivities, transitions, other changes to routine. Obsessions and compulsions can also be different, diff difficult to differentiate from the core symptoms of autism, specifically the rituals and routines that children with autism have. It's also known to be more common in the autism population compared to the general population, along with anxiety and depression. And um, after, um, and I'll, I'll finish, it's okay, you can leave it on that. Um, after uh, implementing behavior interventions, for like for anxiety, creating more structure for kids to transition or um, in high, and that's in lower functioning kids and then in higher functioning ones, you know, adding in CBT, um, we do consider medications and the, the first being the SSRIs, which is this slide um, on the last side. Um, it did show also that hydroxyzine is something we consider, not a lot of evidence, but, and then other ones are, are farther down our list. So with the SSRIs, 
Um, it was thought and hoped that SSRIs would be really effective in autism due to the consistent findings of dysregulated serotonin in individuals with autism. SSRIs are commonly prescribed in patients with autism, but really limited evidence is available. There's mixed results. Um, most of the studies are for RRBs, not for psychiatric comorbidities like anxiety and depression. A couple of SSRIs have been studied, and notably, there's a lot more side effects, even at low doses, and these are thought to potentially limit the uptitration to thera uh, therapeutic doses. Fluoxetine or Prozac is, um, is really well known for causing activation, um, which is a side effect that kind of feels like a restlessness and presents as an irritability or, or agitation. And overall, the response to SSRIs is very is highly variable. They can be very effective in some patients and result in problematic side effects in others. Next slide. So irritability, aggression, I know that we're limited for time. Irritability, aggression, and self-injury are the most, I think, problematic and very common thing that we um, see in autism. These include you know, hitting, biting, uh, head banging, throwing, um, Aggression is more common in lower functioning patients. It's associated with a lot of negative outcomes, restrictive school and residential settings, uh, some physical interventions, abuse, um, increased stress of caretakers, lack of uh, support services, um, or loss of support services rather, and um, just day-to-day -day, uh, family life, which is really um, impacted. Um, the picture here illustrates how disruptive behaviors are observable while the triggers, reinforcers, and comorbidities that drive them are almost always less obvious. Um, and so, um, you know, it's really important just to, to look at the behavior and perform a functional analysis with the help of the ABA provider, evaluate the medical causes, you know, pain can really exacerbate um, agitation. Um, the psychiatric comorbidities, treating those like we just described, um, with um, stimulants and alpha agonists for ADHD, SSRIs for anxiety and other internalizing disorders. Then you consider antipsychotics and this is because of the side effects that we defer that. Uh, next slide and I'll finish this up real quick. So Risperdal and Abilify, I think we're familiar with the FDA approval for irritability associated with autism. Um, effectiveness has been shown by multiple trials. Uh, the most common is the RUP study, um, which showed effectiveness also for stereotypic behaviors and hyperactivity. Um, same, there's been some studies for Abilify, Aripiprazole. Uh, next slide. Here's um, just a visual just showing you the, the degree of response um, in of the change in irritability of uh, Risperdal versus placebo. On the right, there's a 75% CGI, um, very much or much improved after eight weeks versus 12%, uh, which is just a really huge difference. So they're very effective. Next slide. So the side effects, um, increased, uh, lots of side effects, increased appetite and weight um, and metabolic risk being the main thing that we're concerned about in the long term. Um, really prominent with Risperdal. Sedation also common for Risperdal. Uh, both have a low incidence of um, extrapyramidal symptoms and tardive dyskinesia. Um, Risperdal has the gynecomastia. The uh, prolactin is, is elevated in a lot, like 80% of patients on Risperdal, but gynecomastia only happens in about 2%. But it's really worth noting because it's um, a, a very bothersome side effect. Uh, akathisia in, in uh, Abilify is important to be aware of because it can uh, present as increased agitation for patients that can't communicate this uncomfortable kind of restless feeling that they're experiencing. And monitoring weight at every visit, lipids, um, A1C, um, and you really need to evaluate the need for the antipsychotic at every visit. Think about tit titrating down, discontinuing just because of these side effects. Next slide. Um, and I, I probably won't go too, too much into this, but comes up a lot. Um, Sleep-wake issues, more common in lower functioning uh, patients with autism. Behavior is a bi-directional phenomenon that plays a role in sleep. Behavioral interventions are really the primary treatment. The um, little visual on the right is from the um, Autism Speaks uh, toolkit um, that's available. That's for a lower, lower functioning kid to prepare them kind of for the transition to nighttime. Um, there's a, a lot of meds that are used um, for insomnia that 
really aren't evidence-based. We do treat recommend treating comorbid ADHD and anxiety, which can contribute to arousals that um, contribute to insomnia. And melatonin is, um, is known to be effective for sleep latent, in, decreasing sleep latency. And here's just kind of a list, the bold medications on the left, really having our um, higher degrees of evidence with Risperdal and Abilify with the FDA approval and many, many medications having limited or no evidence. Thanks so much. We just have a couple of minutes, um, maybe to take a question or two. And I encourage all of you to um, chain your uh, smartphone camera up to this QR code, and this is how you check in and get credit. But we got a ton of questions about how you get a diagnosis, because you can't get services without a diagnosis. And we know that the specialists who can do this evaluation are few and far between. So if you could give us any pearls as to how to get a diagnosis, like in the system, that would be great specifically comment on what the regional center will or will not do or can or cannot do. Yeah, so I can, I can take a stab at this one. Um, so, um, so of course, you know, we have a center at UCSF, um, the Autism and Neurodevelopmental Disorder Center, um, where we see the whole um, age range and um, um, can help with a lot of these kinds of questions. Um, and the regional center, similar to kind of the school system, has their own um, sort of eligibility criteria to um, evaluate for symptoms and um, sort of level of impairment. And so sometimes it is it can be possible um, to get um, well, we always want to try and get kids early intervention through the regional center. So going through the regional center is really the best kind of um, way of doing that when someone is under three um, and when they're over three, then they are routed to um, the school district. Does that help answer that question? Do you have any practical tips as to where, um, as to where they can actually get like a private evaluation locally since most folks here are local? Uh -huh. Um, yeah, so a private evaluation, um, I think depending on the age, um, there are some resources. Um, I'm happy to, um, if, if anyone wants to email me, um, I'm happy to provide some of those um, if, if need be. I can't think of um, them just like off the top of my head, um, but there are some, but again, it is few and far between. Wonderful. Um, and there are some questions about tips for like getting help for kids, like especially those who um, like might be like higher functioning, maybe identified a little bit later. <laughs> like any thoughts for like how you and girls, like okay, so girls and older kids, kids who might have been a little bit like higher functioning, any tips for getting help for kids like this? Yeah, so for, <clears throat> for getting help um, behaviorally, is that, is that what you mean? Yeah, um, so I think um, psycho like going to see a psychologist or um, a clinical social worker, um, um, those kinds of people um, should ideally be able to help um, manage some of those symptoms. Okay, and how young? can, like for very young infants on the other end, right? We got some questions about, what do you do for the babies that you suspect? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I think you can refer them to, to our clinic. Um, we, are, we have the ability to see very young kids and help track their development over time. Um, and um, um, referring also to a developmental pediatrician, um, I think could also be a, um, a good route to Zara. Do you have anything to add to that? No, I think it, it is a, a challenging process, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is about time for us. We are at one. Um, Thank you so much to our speakers again for coming and speaking to us on this really important topic. Acknowledge that we could not get through all the many, many questions that came through.
We do have this recording. We'll look through them. We'll try to email out maybe some answers to some of the more common ones. And uh, please stay tuned. We've got another webinar on pain management coming up a month from today. And there's a special session on kind of a therapy 101 coming up on a Friday and not a Thursday, March 18th. And it's a longer session. But be on the lookout for emails coming out as to how you can sign up for those. Thanks again.